In this video, I want to introduce the concepts of spontaneity and entropy. Now, the first three units of this course have focused specifically on molecular structure. How are bonds formed in molecules? How do molecules orient themselves in three-dimensional space? What type of orbitals are involved to describe those bonds in molecules, right? It's, it's really focused in on static molecular structure, but we know that chemistry is a dynamic field. And so we want to start to think about what happens when these molecules start to get involved in chemical reactions, right? Something that you've been introduced to in the past, but now we want to um, to start to get a more detailed look into chemical reactions. So let's take a look initially at this reaction that you've probably seen before, right? This reaction is the combustion of methane, right? Um, you have CH4 that reacts with oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide and water and releases some energy, right? Uh, with the knowledge that you have now, right? In the previous course, we looked at uh, looking at the first law of thermodynamics, and that gave us a lot of power to be able to answer questions of energy flow, right? Does this reaction produce heat or absorb heat, right? Is it endothermic or exothermic, right? You might be able to calculate the enthalpy for a reaction of this type, right? Um, and calculate the uh, total energy from the first law of thermodynamics, right? Those are things that were covered in the previous course, but that uh, those tools are very limited in their scope. They can really only answer the question of energy flow. Is energy going into or out of my system? More, more or less like an energy bookkeeping type of thing. Um, but what it really doesn't address, what, what just using the first law of thermodynamics and enthalpy does not address is why this reaction proceeds in this direction in the first place, right? Why does it proceed in this direction and not the opposite direction? Can it proceed in the opposite direction? How likely is that? Um, those are things that you can answer with energy and thermodynamics, but not with the current understanding that we have with just the first law of thermodynamics and just an understanding of enthalpy. So we'll have to broaden our understanding of thermodynamics before we're able to answer questions of why do rea certain reactions happen in the first place, right? Or, is a, or be able to predict, is a reaction likely to occur? Right. And so one of the key pieces in being able to predict whether a reaction is likely to occur or not is this concept of spontaneity. So spontaneity is based on uh, spontaneous processes. So these are any processes that occur without any outside work or intervention. Right. And I think the best way to kind of introduce this topic is just with some general physics uh, processes that we would describe as either spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So here on the left, I've got a guy who is pushing a boulder up a ramp, right? So he has this boulder and he's pushing the boulder up the ramp. Now, if this guy was not there pushing the boulder up the ramp, the boulder would not go up the ramp, right? Very simple to understand. It requires work, right? He has to apply some force Right. Remember, work is some force applied over a distance. So he has to apply some force in order to move the boulder at all up this hill. Right. So this is what we would refer to as a non spontaneous process. Right. Non spontaneous. Right. You take this guy out of the picture. The ball would not roll in this direction unless uh, he was um, applying this applied force to move it up the ramp. Now, in the opposite case, right, so if, if we were just to take this guy and move him back down the ramp and leave the boulder where it was, then the boulder would move down this ramp um, without any assisted force. You wouldn't need anyone pushing on the opposite direction since it's sitting on a downward incline. It would roll down this uh, this incline without any outside intervention or force. This is what we would call a spontaneous process. Right. So this would happen spontaneously until it hits the guy or rolls him over. Right. That's why I have him looking alarmed here. Right. So. Um, so, yeah. So this is a spontaneous process, one that doesn't require any outside uh, work or intervention. A non spontaneous process is one that does require work or intervention, right? If you want to think about a chemical version of a spontaneous process, right? Something we may think about in chemistry, um, think about iron rusting, right? So if you leave iron outside as it's naturally exposed to oxygen and moisture in the air, 
it is going to rust. Now, that's a process that takes a really long time to happen, but it is a spontaneous process. It's going to occur in that direction, right? So this brings up an interesting point about spontaneity. Saying that something is spontaneous in no way means that it's going to occur quickly, right? Spontaneous processes can be fast. They can be slow. All we're really saying is that we are guaranteed that this process will occur with no outside intervention force or energy. Now, a key thermodynamic property in order to figure out whether something is spontaneous or not is entropy. Right. So entropy and we use the uh, variable a capital S to denote entropy. Right. So we're going to go through we're going to have a couple of different definitions for entropy um, and I'll give the mathematical definition in the video on the second law of thermodynamics. But for now, just think of entropy as a measure of molecular randomness or disorder. Right. So this is a measure. Of molecular. Randomness. or disorder, right? So you may have heard this definition used before in the past, right? It's, it's entropy is a measure of disorder, right? So um, everything is going to tend towards disorder. That's going to be the second law of thermodynamics. But you can think of entropy at this point just as a measure of molecular randomness or disorder. And it's going to be a key quantity for us in order to figure out uh, whether a process is going to be spontaneous or not. Now, entropy is very important. In fact, it's so important that the guy who invented the equation for entropy has that equation nestled right above his gravestone. So this is the gravestone of Ludwig Boltzmann. And if you've taken statistics or even some physics classes before, you've probably heard Boltzmann's name before, right? The Boltzmann constant. Um, you know, you've probably heard this before, but his biggest claim to fame was figuring out this equation for entropy, which if you can't see it, it says that the entropy S is equal to K log W where K is the Boltzmann constant and W is something known as the degeneracy. But you can kind of think of that W as just a measure of the randomness, right? So this entropy is going to be equal to this equation. And it's, it's so popular that it sits above his gravestone. Okay, so we're going to make this link between entropy and spontaneity very explicit when we talk about the second law of thermodynamics. What I want to do for the rest of this video is just kind of give you a little bit of insight into how intuitive entropy is into kind of discussing what processes are likely to occur, right? So let's think about this following example that I have drawn out here, right? So what I have here is a two bulb uh, system that has like a stopcock in the middle that you can turn to open or close respectively, right? In this, in this one, I have a, a ideal gas on the left, on the left bulb and a vacuum on the right bulb, right? So if you open this stopcock, then the gas is going to expand uh, spontaneously, right? So this opening and expansion of the gas is going to be a spontaneous process, right? You, it won't require any outside work. There will not have to be any forcing or pushing of the gas into the other bulb. It is going to expand to the other bulb spontaneously, right? Gases will always expand to fill the available volume spontaneously. And if you want to kind of think about it, think about it. What if we tried to go the opposite way, right? What if we tried to take this uh, gas that's now expanded into the two bulbs and we wanted to return it to this original state? Well, we'd have to either evacuate some of the gas from this bulb, return this to vacuum, reclose the stopcock, right? It's going to take a lot of energy and work in order to compress the gas back into a single bulb uh, versus if you just open it up and make all the space available to it, the gas is going to expand to fill that entire volume, right? So that would be the spontaneous process of gases expanding. Right. So and let's think about it from another perspective. So let's take this two bulb system, the same two bulb system we've been working with or we, that we saw in the last one. Right. And let's say that, for example, there are four specific gas molecules in this two bulb system. We got uh, molecule A, B, C and D. Right. These four gas particles make up our entire system. 
if we think about it in this way, then we can think of five different ways that we could arrange these gas particles. We could have one arrangement where all of the gas particles are in the left bulb. That's this arrangement one. We could have an arrangement where one gas particle is in the right bulb and the other three are in the left bulb. We can have an arrangement where two gas particles are in the left bulb and two are in the right bulb. A fourth one where three are in the four, uh, left right bulb and the one le gas particle left is in the left bulb. And finally, we can have one where all four gas particles are in the right bulb. Now, what if I were to ask you, if you were to pick one of these states at random, which one are you most likely to pick? The answer here is going to be arrangement three, right? Why is that, right? Why would you be most likely to pick, um, if you were to pick one randomly, right? And, and just be able to stop the system and pick one at randomly, why would it be that you would pick one most likely in arrangement three? Well, because it has the most possible states, right? It's, there's the most possible different ways that we can distribute these particles exist where two particles are in the left and two particles on the right. We have six different ways we can distribute it in that fashion, whereas we only have four for arrangements two and, and four, and we only have one for arrangements one and four. It will be very unlikely to find the um, to find a system in arrangement one or arrangement four, right? So this is how nature works, right? Something that is more disordered right, is more likely, right? Something that is spontaneous is likely to occur, right? So, so you can kind of uh, glean a little bit of a qualitative understanding of why entropy uh, and spontaneity have this link just from looking at what is likely and what, you know, has more disorder associated with it, right? So, um, so like I said, we'll make this uh, link between spontaneity and entropy very explicit in the next video. I just wanted to give you a little bit of insight here. Now, the last thing I wanted to touch on in this video is the entropy associated with phase changes, right? So keep in mind, our three main phases of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. And they look very different on a molecular level, right? Solids are very tightly, densely packed together. Liquids are, you know, relatively densely packed, but a little bit more loose than solids. And gases, of course, uh, can bounce all over the place and they really don't have any um, ordered structure to them. So that maps perfectly onto entropy. So the entropy of a solid is going to be very, very low. The entropy of a liquid is going to be a little bit higher and the entropy of a gas is going to be much, much higher. Right. So hopefully this gives you a good introduction into entropy and the idea of spontaneity. In the next video, we're going to make this link between entropy and spontaneity a little bit more specific and uh, rooted in thermodynamics by discussing the second law of thermodynamics.